of Physics, and uh, relating to Homecoming Week, uh, the Physics Department has arranged for some special talks by a special speaker. We have invited Dr. Dennis Alexander, Director of the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion at St. Edmunds College in Cambridge to speak. He gave his he uh, presented a wonderful speech this or talk this afternoon, and is continuing with uh, this evening presentation. We thank you all for attending. Uh, We'll say a few words about our speaker. Dr. Dennis Alexander is director of the Faraday Institute, as I said, uh, where he's a fellow. Dr. Alexander was previously chairman of the Molecular Immunology Program and head of the Laboratory of uh, Lymphocyte Signaling and Development at the uh, Babram Institute in Cambridge. Prior to that, Dr. Alexander was at the Imperial Cancer Research Laboratory in London, which is now the Cancer Research UK and spent 15 years developing university departments and laboratories overseas, uh, including as associate professor of biochemistry in the medical facility at the American University of Beirut, Lebanon, where he helped to establish the National Unit of Human Genetics. Dr. Alexander was initially an open scholar at Oxford, uh, where he was reading uh, biochemistry, before obtaining his PhD in neurochemistry at the Institute of Psychiatry in London. Dr. Alexander writes, lectures, and broadcast and broadcast widely in the field of science and religion. Since 1992, he has been editor of the journal Science and the Christian Belief, and currently serves on the National Committee of Christians in Science and as a member of the International Society for Science and Religion. Uh, we are very happy to have Dr. Alexander speaking with us tonight. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for your welcome. Uh, just checking sound, is sound on in the back? Anybody who can't hear me, just wave an arm. I just wanted to say actually for any folk who are sitting in uncomfortable positions, there's some seats tucked away over here and I don't mind a bit if you come and occupy them. I'm one of these people who was always late for lectures actually. I have huge sympathy with people who are late for lectures because I am, I'm afraid, so this is confession time. We actually have a tradition at Cambridge University. It's not even really polite to start right on time. You know, we have to start about three minutes past just to allow latecomers and people to come in. So, uh, so if you need a seat and getting uncomfortable, please don't hesitate to, to come over. Okay, so we have this rather robust title this evening, The Dawkins Delusion, Debunking the Conflict Between uh, Science and Faith. I suppose I ought to start out as I'm a biologist by saying I'm actually an admirer of the writings of Richard Dawkins on the subject of um, evolutionary biology. If you never read any of his popular books, um, particularly a book like The Ancestor's Tale or some of those books which are really um, very well written and uh, attractive, accessible explanations of what evolutionary biology is all about, then uh, I, I recommend them. So I want to emphasize this evening, give, given that we've put Richard Dawkins in the title of the talk, that I have no particular um, quarrel with uh, Richard Dawkins when it comes to the subject of evolution. Instead, the title of my talk is actually derived from Dawkins' writings on religion. Faith, Dawkins argues, in the name of science, is a kind of mental illness, one of the world's great evils, comparable to the smallpox virus, but harder to eradicate. So here we clearly have someone who is the, uh, the master of hyperbole. And if you're familiar at all with his book, The God Delusion, which of course came out now a few years ago, um, then basically it's, it's a sort of rant against religion. And it's very different in its style of argumentation and literature compared to uh, his books about evolutionary biology. You have many recycle arguments. Um, you have many kind of invective uh, arguments as well against religion and so, so forth and so on. And indeed, if you follow that particular publishing episode, then you'll know that many of the reviewers, in fact, who gave Dawkins the hardest time um, about his book uh, were fellow atheists who felt that Richard Dawkins was letting the side down in giving such a poorly um, argued defense of atheism. And so just as uh, Christians cringe, I think sometimes when they read extremist comments which are made by their fellow Christians. And so the atheist community cringes when uh, one of its better known advocates lets its side down so badly. And this is a friend of mine, Michael Ruse, who commented that the God delusion is an embarrassed to, or actually makes me embarrassed to be an atheist, he said. 
And uh, that, that's not atypical, I think, of some of the responses that have come from the atheist community about that style of writing. And so perhaps it wasn't surprising when Richard Dawkins' book came out and this whole wave of other books from the so-called New Atheists and so forth that it led many cultural commentators to speak of the rise of atheistic fundamentalism. But of course, to maintain that conflict, um, you need an opposite pole, uh, readily supplied, of course, by those Christians who use biblical texts to try and extract scientific information about the age of the earth or about the origins of biological diversity, and thereby, I would want to say, impose a modernistic interpretation um, upon the text that is quite alien to the culture and intentionality of the original authors. And I think it's true to say that in any uh, major discussion of this kind, you need the two opposite poles to really um, keep both poles alive. I think it's true in polarized debates that the opposite ends of the debates uh, are often more similar to each other than both sides would like to admit. Sociologically, uh, fundamentalist atheism really does look quite like fundamentalist religion. And certainly in the case of my own country in the UK, the media, I'm sure it's the same over here, the media loves extremes, they love stirring things up, um, they love, love getting people arguing in studios and so on and so forth. And um, not least, the publishers uh, love to um, uh, stir things up in order to, of course, get books well known and uh, do a lot of book sales and so forth. I think what we notice in the middle of all this sort of media froth, I'm going to call it, is that science is often being used as an ideological tool to promote incompatible positions that go well beyond science itself, and that leads inevitably to conflict. So what I want to do this evening is to stand back a little bit, um, watch some of the professors of physics trying to tackle technology. I always enjoy that, so. <laughs> okay, there you are. Hey, round of applause. So, yeah. um, I have to tell you actually about, um, I was giving a talk in Oxford um, a few years ago, and uh, this is, by the way, not part of the main talk. I just made me think of it. And um, of course, they couldn't get the system going. My laptop wouldn't talk to the projector, the usual kind of problem. And we had no less than three full professors of physics from Oxford University <laughs> trying to solve this problem, which they couldn't do. And then a PhD student just wandered up and click, and then it worked beautifully, you know. So you want something to work, you know, find the youngest person in the audience, and they're bound to fix it. So that's always my philosophy. Anyway, what I was saying is I want to stand back from the media froth. Let us take a little bit of a calm uh, look at this whole discussion. And first of all, I want to start by giving, of course, one very major reason why I think the, this kind of conflict idea between science and faith, which is sadly so prevalent in our societies today, um, actually lacks plausibility. And there are <clears throat> many reasons why it lacks plausibility. But one of those reasons is, of course, a historical reason. Perhaps more than any other factor that undermines the conflict model between science and faith is the way in which religious belief has contributed so much to the historical emergence of modern science, which I'm sure you're all very well aware of. And as I'm sure you know, many of the natural philosophers, as scientists were called in earlier centuries, were people of deep faith, often deep Christian faith, who played very key roles in the founding of the disciplines that we as scientists enjoy practicing today. And I've just put a few examples of those um, great um, his people from the history of science up on the screen in front of you. We think of people like Robert Boyle, one of the founders of uh, modern chemistry, who wrote much about his uh, Christian beliefs. Astrom astronomers like uh, Johannes Kepler and Galileo, of course. Uh, naturalists such as John Ray, Linnaeus, whose uh, biological classification system we still use in a modified form to the present day. And many, many people working in the physical sciences, uh, people like, of course, Isaac Newton, Michael Faraday, Clark Maxwell, Eddington. I mean, one could go on and on with just hundreds of examples of great Christian committed uh, believers from the history of science who contributed so much to the emergence of modern science. And as you probably know, Newton, in fact, wrote far more about um, biblical studies and theology than he ever did about science. It's often said that Newton did his scientific discover discoveries in his spare time when he wasn't studying the Bible, and actually there's a lot of truth in that. The laws of inheritance upon which all of my uh, recent 
biological work uh, depends, as many I'm sure in this room today were first worked out by an Austrian monk, Gregor Mendel, in the garden on, of his monastery. Now it's not just that um, their Christian faith gave these early natural philosophers a great motivation to do their science, that's so obviously the case, but it's also that their Christian theology helped to shape many of the assumptions and tools which are commonly used in modern science today. So I want to spend a little bit of time in summarizing very briefly how historians have suggested that a Christian worldview made an impact on the emergence of modern science. And notice that we're not talking here about how theology uh, sort of became fed directly into the actual content of scientific theories, although there is some evidence for that as well, but rather the way that the theological ideas help to construct the very tools, the very ways of thinking that we just take for granted now and we think have always been there when, of course, they haven't. They were invented, they were discovered, they were introduced into the scientific method. I think very often in this largely secular scientific community in which many of us work today, uh, many of my scientific colleagues don't realize how many of the tools and ideas that they use in their science um, have these deep theological roots. First of all then, the notion of the laws of science is actually quite a recent concept. It was nurtured particularly out of the theistic uh, convictions of people like Newton and Robert Boyle and Descartes especially. And of course the idea was just as uh, there is a, a moral God, a God who establishes moral laws in the universe, therefore by inference these early Christian natural, natural philosophers uh, inferred there must also be laws, scientific laws, that are waiting there to be discovered because they believed and worshipped a rational God who had created a rational mathematical universe. And so that gave a good basis for the idea that there must be laws in a way that had never been discovered um, in any other culture uh, of the world up until that time. As Descartes wrote to Mersenne on April the 15th, 1630, God established these laws in nature in the same way as a king establishes in his kingdom. What is more, good, God put them in our souls as a king would inscribe his laws on the hearts of all his subjects if he were able to do it. So lawmaking, point number one. Point number two, a second theme that we often find in the natural philosophers is the idea that the contingency of God's actions encourages an empirical attitude towards the natural world. The fact that everything is ultimately completely dependent upon God's continual sustaining. In other words, the God of the Bible, to put it a bit crudely, can do what he likes, and it's up to natural philosophers to find what this, out, what this is empirically by experimental methods. You cannot work it out, they said, by working it out from first principles as the early uh, Greek natural philosophers would have thought, at least many, many of them, but you actually have to do experiments. And this point was made over and over again by these early natural philosophers. Here's an example uh, by Coates, who is writing the preface to the um, second edition of Newton's great work, the Principia Mathematica. And these were words clearly approved by Newton himself. And he writes that without all doubt, this world could arise from nothing but the perfectly free will of God. These laws of nature, therefore, we must not seek from uncertain conjectures, but learn them from observations and experiments. If you want to know what God does in the world, you've got to do experiments. You can't just simply work it out by a long process of rational deduction. The third theme, as we think about the Christian roots of science, is maybe a little bit counterintuitive, and it's a little bit unexpected, and it actually relates to the Christian doctrine of the fall and its perceived impact on the ability of natural philosophers to gain access to the truth. And this thesis has been very well expounded by Peter Harrison, who's professor of science and religion at Oxford, in his book called The Fall of Man and the Foundations of Science, it came out a few years ago now. And what Peter has done in this book is to amass a huge amount of historical data to show that the idea that the mind is fallen, which was a conviction shared by all the natural philosophers of the time, pretty much without exception, led them to a deep suspicion of unaided reason as a way of arriving at truths about nature, using, once again, those sort of deductive processes so familiar from Greek philosophy. And this, in turn, uh, as Peter um, expounds, stimulated the emergence of the empirical method because clearly the only way to establish reliable truths, again, was to find out how nature actually worked. 
This wasn't something that you could work out uh, from first principles, not with a fallen mind. And so in Harrison's uh, view, at his inception, modern science was conceptualized as a means of recapturing the knowledge of nature that Adam had once possessed, and so reversing the effects of the fall. And I want to give you just one example of that, um, well expressed by Robert Hooke. He was the curator of experiments at the Royal Society in London, one of the earliest uh, uh, scientific societies to be established. This is from his preface to his book, Micrographia. He was um, one of the people who really first used the telescope to study the biological world. That is a magnified flea, by the way, in case you're wondering what that is. But the point of showing this is his quotation, where he notes that every man both from a derived corruption innate and born within him, and from his breeding and converse with men, is very subject to slip into all sorts of errors. These being the dangers in the process of human reason, the remedies of them all can only proceed from the real, the mechanical, the experimental philosophy. And the, the mechanical philosophy, the experimental philosophy, was the name for science as it was emerging in his period. Then the fourth theme in the scientific revolution that has strongly um, theological overtones is the enthusiasm of many of these early natural philosophers for what came to be called, um, as we were just seeing, the new mechanical philosophy. Now, from our perspective, it might seem a little bit surprising um, that the machine picture of the world actually was supported by the Christian theology of the 17th century. Because sometimes now people look on machines as being dehumanizing or maybe alienating or maybe not particularly theologically uh, friendly, um, but that was certainly not the case in the 17th century. Because remember, the, the, the machine for the natural philosophers of the 17th century was always God's machine, and they didn't any, see any sort of tension between uh, mechanism and meaning. So we have, for example, the astronomer um, Kepler writing, my aim is to show the heavenly machine is not a kind of divine live being, but a kind of clockwork. Then we have uh, Robert Boyle. Um, his clockwork universe was constructed by a wise god in such a way that it needed no constant adjustments. And in a comment which I think has some very interesting resonances and insights into the contemporary debates about uh, intelligent design, Boyle said um, this, he said, it more sets off the wisdom of God in the fabric of the universe that he can make so vast a machine perform all those many things which he designed it should by the mere contrivance of brute matter managed by certain laws of local motion and upheld by his ordinary and general concourse that if from time to time he employed an intelligent overseer such as nature is fancied to be to regulate, assist and control the motions of the past. They did rather go for long sentences in, the, in their papers of the 17th century but I don't know if you can get through that rather long sentence but basically Paul is saying here you know God is the author of everything that exists He's not just occasionally intervening or doing special tricks, as it were, out there in, in nature. There is no such thing as nature. Boyle wanted to say, he wrote another book saying that very clearly, um, but God is in charge of the whole, uh, the whole show, if you like. And often in the theological writings of this period, we find repeated this idea of the two books. As the two great books of nature and of scripture have the same author, so the study of the latter does not at all hinder an inquisitive man's delight in the study of the former. This is Robert Boyle in his amazing book, The Excellence of Theology in 1665. So let's not think that this discussion between science and faith is anything new. I mean, these people in, this, in the 17th century were really writing a lot about uh, their faith um, in God and about the Bible and how it related to their science and so forth. And really apart from the occasional quarrel between science and the church, I mean that warm cousinly relationship between science and faith really carried on for many, many centuries. There was the occasional quarrel, but really the quarrels uh, were very small compared to the companionship between the friendship between science and faith that carried on right up until um, the 19th century. And particularly I think in Britain and North America that was the case where natural theology was still preached from um, early uh, the, the 19th century churches uh, well on into the 19th century. And uh, so I guess it raises the idea, now as we look at our present cultural situation, where did this idea of science and religion, uh, conflict between science and religion come from? And it turns out to be a relatively new idea. Now, of course, if you're listening to an English person and he comes from Cambridge, you know, that means when he says new, it doesn't quite mean 
what things mean by new over here. You know, we have to take that uh, contrast. New, new College in Oxford, I think, was founded in about the 16th century, uh, and so on. So th I know the word new has different nuances, but relatively recently, this conflict has come into being. Now, natural theology in Britain probably reached the peak of its influence during the first half of the 19th century. In early part of the 19th century, every undergraduate in Cambridge, if you came to Cam Cambridge in the early part of the 19th century, you would have to definitely read um, Arch Arch Archdeacon uh, Paley's, William Paley's book, uh, Natural Theology, and some of his other books, Evidences of Christianity, Moral Philosophy, and you would be examined on these books as part of your course. And when Darwin is writing his autobiography, as quoted here, he looks back on those days as saying, well, actually, reading Paley was about the only useful thing that I ever did when I was up there at Cambridge. Um, he wasn't actually very focused on his work at Cambridge, I have to say. Um, he, he was much uh, busier in doing a few other things. But anyway, we don't need to go there this evening. So it was during the, the latter half, really, of the 19th century, with the growing professionalization of science, that most historians see the roots of the conflict model as far as Britain is concerned, and a parallel, uh, sort of somewhat different, but similar process was going on over here at the same period. Just look, to, to, to get a handle on this, let's look at what science was like in Britain in 1800. It was largely an activity run by amateurs. Financial support uh, for science was mainly by private uh, patronage. Uh, there were very few opportunities for kind of scientific employment in the way we understand it today. Most scientific research was carried out by gentlemen of leisure. They had their own private funding. They were typically uh, clerics, people with private lands. Most of the natural history of the early part of the 19th century, the first half of the 19th century in Britain was carried out by, uh, by clerics, by vicars in the Anglican church. They had the time. They all had beetle collections and butterfly collections and so on. And the Royal Society then provided a kind of rather fashionable forum in which the sort of gentlemen of leisure could get together and discuss their latest uh, discoveries and so forth. And it, it was a bit of a, a gentleman's, a London gentleman's club. Specialization was very rare, it was very common to dabble in all kinds of things. You have your great polymaths of the early part of the 19th century. And patronage and employment uh, in science was much easier to find if you were ordained in the Church of England, in this case, if you're a cleric. And uh, certainly in Oxford and Cambridge, you had to be ordained in the Church of England to, to teach in the university right up until um, 1870 in, in the case of both Oxford and Cambridge. So the whole of teaching of science in, in Britain was dominated by, by clerical teachers. Now you look at 1900, complete contrast during 100 years. The scientific enterprise by then was, was not so dissimilar to the one that we recognize today. Scientists had a name, a new name, which everybody then agreed on, uh, which was a, uh, something that hadn't been invented until 1834. Uh, they had a new status of professionals. Uh, numerically, they were far greater than in 1800. Public spending on science had increased dramatically, both in North America and in Britain and other countries. And of course, science was beginning to become much more specialized. And this was reflected in this huge growth in the number of journals and, and uh, specialist societies and so forth, so forth that were going on. Very significant for our discussion today. The clerics were much less represented in the scientific world, and their own calling had, mu had become itself much more professionalized during the latter part of the 19th century because of these very rapid growing urbanized populations with a need for churches and their need for social work and so on and so forth. And I think scientists, it would be true to say, were motivated much less by the tenets of natural theology in 1900 than they had been in 1800. They were much more likely to practice their religious beliefs as something separate from their professional life as a scientist, which I guess is the situation today. And scientific education also was now a major emphasis in both the universities and in the secondary schools. And so it's been convincingly, I think, argued um, that the social changes required for this very dramatic social transition from 1800 to 1900 really lies at the heart of the so-called Victorian conflict thesis. And from the 1850s onwards, a new cohort of scientists, of professionalized scientists, arose who uh, were very keen on defending the professional rights and status of, society, uh, of scientists. Mostly they were fellows of the Royal Society. Uh, some of them gathered themselves into the so-called X Club, which was a kind of dining club, and they campaigned for their political goals um, using the Royal Society as a tool. 
And these are people who had grown up on the peripheries of the establishment, people like Thomas Henry Huxley. They were outside this privileged circle who had easy access to financial support for their science. And Thomas Henry Huxley in particular was very pugnacious in his uh, use really of science as a battering ram to try and obtain for the new, newly formed profession of scientists the kind of prestige and money especially that belonged then to the, the rather fat and contented Anglican church in, in Britain. And uh, this gives you a little feel if you're not familiar with this quote. Um, he loved his rhetoric and once he uh, he said in one of his speeches that extinguished theologians lie about the cradle of every science as the strangled snakes beside that of Hercules. And history records that wherever science and orthodoxy have been fairly opposed, the latter have been forced to retire from the less bleeding and crushed, if not annihilated, scotched, if not slain. Well, he was a sort of Richard Dawkins of the late 19th century. And this was the kind of rhetoric that was used at that time. So I think most historians would see the conflict thesis was not born out of uh, the conflict between evil, Darwinism and the church. That's, that's really a misreading, I think, of the text of the time. But it was born out of this ideological campaign to establish scientists as the leading intellectual voice in society with established prestige as an independent professional community. And over here, there was a very parallel process um, going on, particularly, of course, to do with the increasing secularization of the educational world. Um, this was marked by, by um, events such as the founding of Cornell in 1865. Um, Andrew Dixon White was its co-founder. He was president for nearly 20 years. Um, as you will know better than I, nearly all the American universities up until that time had been uh, belonging or in the hands of different uh, Christian denominations. So Cornell was really a departure and going off in a new direction in this way and was established specifically as a non-sectarian school. And I think it was no accident that later it was Andrew Dixon White who authored this book called The History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom. And the driving force of that book um, was to show how education should be free of any kind of religious control. And uh, those interested in the history of education in this country may be familiar with George Marsden's interesting book, The Soul of the American University, From Protestant Establishment to Established Non-Belief, which traces the sort of secularization of education. If you take the 21 elite universities, which have recently been studied by Elaine Howard Eklund so brilliantly in the book, which was just published called Science Versus uh, religion, I think it's the title, uh, which is a sociological study of the religious composition of, um, of the scientific community in this country. And she points out that out of the 21 elite universities that she was investigating, nine of these had uh, a religious mission uh, when they first started, although now that has been completely lost. So other titles from this era sort of speak for themselves, really. You have The History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science by J.W. Draper. Later on, the early part of this 20th uh, century, you have Landmarks in the Struggle Between Science and Religion by J.Y. Simpson. And these books achieved immense sales. They helped in shaping the views of several generations concerning, concerning this relationship between science and religion. And they stand as sort of classic examples of what is sometimes called a Whig view of history. These tales of triumphant scientists winning great victories over the enemies of science, these retrograde clerics who were keeping the people in ignorance and darkness. It was a sort of 19th century Victorian narrative of, of a victory of the great forward-looking progressive science over the, the powers of darkness and so forth. And it was in that kind of era that this language of warfare between science and religion, which had never been there before, um, came into the English language. And when things come into a language, when they are part of what we're brought up with, then they are very, very powerful as cultural influential tools. So in the 19th century, you have the mythology invented that medieval put, people thought the world was flat. I won't embarrass anybody here by asking you how many people think the medieval people thought the world was flat, but of course they didn't, but that was invented in the 19th century. Um, in the 19th century, you get invented the, hist the wonderful uh, triumphant tale of Galileo and uh, his opposition to the church and so on. I mean, it was there, but that was only turned into a great uh, rhetorical triumphant tale in the 19th century and so forth. And today, no 
historian of science really accepts the warfare metaphor um, proposed by the titles of those books as an adequate description of the historical relationship between science and faith. And one has to say that, in fact, um, the earlier distortions and mutations um, which those early books represented are still with us today. I mean, some of the history is just simply made up, actually, um, about their, their conflict examples from the supposed history of science and faith. They simply completely made up, and uh, that's been tracked, of course, by many historians. So if you are interested in those mythologies that have come into the relationship um, between science and faith, if you're not familiar with this book, I thoroughly recommend it. Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About Science and Religion, edited by Ron Numbers, came out just last year. Um, a really a wonderful collection of essays about some of these uh, mythologies, and the myth mythologies are very difficult to shake. In the secular scientific community in which I, I live and have my being, or I have been over these past decades, um, you know, the, these mythologies are deeply embedded, and often scientists don't read much about the history of science, unfortunately, and it's very difficult to, uh, to get, sort of demythologize some of these uh, embedded myths that get into people's minds. Now, I've gone into the history in a little bit of detail this evening, because I think um, often scientists themselves don't realize how deep in theology are the roots of their own disciplines, and they don't realize either how recent is this conflict between uh, science and religion. And of course, once a conflict is established, then it's very easy to keep pouring some fuel on the flames. The media will do that very happily for us. Um, of course, you get uh, fuel pulled on the flames by the new atheists on one hand, and this is actually a London bus. Did you ever see this London bus? This was the advertisement on a London bus um, last year. There is probably no God, now stop worrying. People love that. And enjoy your life. That was the other part. That's right. So uh, that was followed up, by the way, with the kind of all kinds of counter advertisements. You can imagine how that went anyway. Uh, but, you know, the media loves these sort of things and they pour fuel on the flames and so they keep the whole show on the road in terms of the conflict thesis. And I think what's interesting in the contemporary debate is the way in which science is so often deployed ideologically in a way that goes well beyond the science itself. And you see this goes way back in the history of science. You get a great big scientific theory, it's very successful, it gets prestige, and then you get all kinds of interest groups that move in and they start utilizing that theory um, for all kinds of political, social, religious, anti-religious goals that go well beyond the original science itself. And so you get a sort of social transformation of the theory, it gets ideologically invested, and then finally what happens is the public understanding of scientific theory X becomes equated with ideological meaning Y. And so when people hear the word evolution, you know, in the public domain, they're not really thinking about biology at all, but they're thinking about lots of other things as well. And one has to say that um, Darwinian evolution has been particularly abused um, in this kind of process over um, these uh, one and a half centuries uh, since uh, the publication of The Origin of Species. In fact, it's been used to support almost every kind of ism that you can possibly imagine. It's been used in support of capitalism, uh, communism, socialism, racism, militarism, feminism, theism, anti-theism, atheism, and on and on you can go. I mean, evolution has been used in support of pretty much every ism you can imagine, and given that quite a few of them are mutually contradictory, you can see that something very strange is going on here. There's a process of social transformation whereby people are utilizing a biological theory ideologically for reasons really that go way beyond anything the theory can possibly prop up. And I think that helps us to understand, of course, some of the conflict we've seen in the public domain between evolution and religious belief. And maybe I can do a plug for another book, uh, which I've recently co-edited with uh, Ron Numbers, the historian from Wisconsin-Madison, just came out earlier this year um, from Chicago University Press, called Biology and Ideology from Descartes to Dawkins. This is a book of 13 essays written mostly by historians tracking all the various ways in which biology has been used and abused for non-biological reasons from 1600 to the present day. And it, it's really just, I, I can say this because I didn't write it, I just wrote a bit of the preface, but it's a fascinating review of um, all these different kinds of ways. And, and that process is still going on right up until the present day.
I think it's worth pointing out that as far as the contemporary dialogue between science and religion is concerned, um, the vocal proponents of the conflict model, certainly within the British scientific community, people like um, Richard Dawkins and, excuse me, and a few others, are actually rather a rare species. My own experience of being in that community for many years now is that um, it's not typical. Actually, his voice is not really typical of the biological research community in my country, I have to say. Um, and I think it's only the uh, media exposure that goes with these rather extreme positions, in fact, that gives the public the impression that this is the view of the whole biological research community. Um, certainly, I, I don't know what it's like over here, it's certainly not the case in the UK. Personally, I have to say I was a Christian already when I went into uh, biological research. I've never found the idea of conflict between science and faith as being remotely persuasive. I have to say also that I've never found any um, hostility towards my own Christian faith uh, being in the scientific community over these years. And maybe I've just been lucky in that respect, but in my neck of the woods, at least, I find um, the tribe of scientists generally to be a rather tolerant kind of a tribe and very accepting of people of any faith or none and so forth. So I, I want to put that on the table because I think sometimes people can get the wrong impression um, you know, just by reading media articles and TV programs, whatever. Okay, now we've spent quite a bit of time on the conflict thesis. So I want to turn now to the more positive aspects of the relationship between science and faith this evening. I want to talk specifically about some of the similarities, which I think are so fascinating, and of the ways in which we can build bridges between these two great domains of human thought and practice. A model for relating science and faith that I found personally much more convincing uh, than the conflict model is what we might want to call an integrated model of complementarity. And so here we imagine the, the book of life, if you like, the reality that we all experience as we go through life is being like a cube as shown here, and it's sliced into many different layers, and each layer represents one particular type of explanation or insight into the world around us. And so, of course, we have the scientific level, which gives us the mechanisms and how things work and so forth and so on. We have the ethical levels of insight, which helps us to address the uh, questions of what we ought to do in the world, of what we count as being good and evil, and so on. We have the aesthetic level of explanation where we're looking at what we count as beauty in the world and uh, what we count as beauty in literature and art and, and so forth. Uh, we have our own personal level of description, which is unique to us, uh, which will never be re reproduced by anybody else in the world, however long this world lasts for. Um, and, of course, then we have many other levels of description you could put in there. And then we have religious levels of insight and description where we're asking questions like, well, why is there a universe anyway? And then the question like Stephen Hawking likes to ask, what breathes far into the equations? Uh, questions about purpose, meaning how it might to live my life and so on. And, of course, the point of this kind of model is that there is absolutely no need at all why these different levels of explanation or insight should be in conflict with one another. We need them all to do justice to this complex reality that we call life. And the only problem comes if a person wants to come along and say, well, my level of description is the only one that counts. And that is the philosophy of scientism. When we get to level one, that scientific level, where the scientist wants to say, well, my description of biology, that's, that's all that counts. None of these other levels count at all. That's the philosophy of scientism. But that's not science. And, of course, we notice that none of these levels by themselves are sufficient, in fact, to do justice to what we really experience. I mean, science obviously is not going to, it's not going to decide whether a painting is beautiful or not, uh, whether the sunset we saw tonight was really um, a wonderful sunset, even though it may be the broad parameters of what we count as beautiful or not might or might not be hardwired into our brains. But the point is, in practice, the humanities lie largely beyond science, which is obviously why we have different departments and faculties and so forth. Now, the slight no model is perfect. Obviously, I'm not suggesting this model is the only one to use when we're relating science and faith. And one of its dangers is we might think the different levels are somehow uh, separate from each other. They're not really joined up. And so we like to put some arrows in there to illustrate the fact there's this fascinating discourse going on all the time between these different levels. How do we relate cognitive psychology to theology and, and so on and so forth? How do we relate uh, evolution of biology to 
uh, theological insights and so forth. In practice, I actually think, although I have no clear data for this, but my impression is that most scientists in practice uh, are practicing complementarians, even though they might not actually um, understand or know that language. And, and so I think they would probably go along with uh, somebody like Lord Martin Rees, who's president of the Royal Society and a uh, cosmologist, who remarks that the preeminent mystery is why anything exists at all. What breathes life into the equations and actualize them in a real cosmos? Such questions lie beyond science. They are the province of philosophers and theologians. And I think that is fairly typical. He recognizes, you know, science is really not going to ask, answer all the questions that people might like to ask. The problem, as I say, comes if you have somebody who wants to say that their own particular level of description is the only one that counts. Here's a classic example from the late Francis Crick, writing that the astonishing hypothesis is that you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. And this philosophy of scientism has sometimes been dubbed nothing buttery because these scientific statements are so often introduced by the term uh, nothing but or no more than. But of course the uh, complementary model would wish to point out the, this scientific approach is, uh, is simply much too simple, uh, much too simplistic in fact, and indeed the brain and mind gives us a very nice uh, kind of example of the complementary model in action. So we have the uh, relationship between brain and mind and personhood, which surely are complementary levels of insight into the one and the same reality, but the I story of our own minds, which obviously no one can avoid using, and neither should we try and avoid it, our own personal awareness. That's complementary to the neuroscientist's description of our own brains um, in terms of neuroscience and so forth, and then we have our own personal biographies, which is also, if you like, the, the outcome of that. So these sort of uh, examples, I think, are useful in ex uh, kind of exemplifying the complementary model. Another um, example which uh, perhaps undermines the philosophy of, um, oh, okay, I was going to give you another example, the relationship between evolutionary biology and, uh, and well, that's not there, but I want to say also that we can use a similar kind of model in describing the relationship between evolutionary biology and the Christian doctrine of creation. That These are two complementary narratives which are really trying to do different kinds of work in terms of their approach um, to the origins of biological diversity. Here's another example. Um, this is a headline that came out in the Times of London, a newspaper. Um, Hawking, God did not create universe declared this particular headline. It's a bit unusual for a headline in the Times, but there it is. And this is connected with uh, Stephen Hawking's new book, The Grand Design. It's a, uh, a book speculating about the early history of the universe. There's actually not very much new in the book, according to my cosmology friends, but there we are. But what's striking in this particular uh, commentary in his book, which led to all these headlines and discussion, is a sort of naivety, really, of the theology. And so Hawking wishes to tell us that M-theory um, explains how the universe uh, popped into being out of nothing. But when Hawking writes about um, creation from nothing, he does not, of course, really mean nothing. This is apparent from his comment that because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. But of course, gravity and the laws of nature are not nothing. As Hawking claims, they are simply scientific ways of referring to something. And it's precisely the theist point that God is the ultimate source of all those somethings, whatever they might be, the, the laws of nature or, or mathematical principles or whatever it might be. And the God of the Abrahamic faiths is the source of all that. So anything else which exists apart from God then is part of the creation. And so the descriptions that science provides of all those things that exist are not in any kind of rivalry with the Christian doctrine of creation, which is about why anything exists in the first place. So we have to be careful here, as I say, that we don't slip into 
uh, the favorite model of the late Stephen Jay Gould with his idea of non-overlapping uh, magisteria. It's certainly in the case that science and faith are asking different kinds of question. But I want to say, I think this evening, what is really striking to me much more are these sort of similarities in the ways of thinking about science and faith. And for reasons of time, I just want to flag up two of these similarities uh, for you. Uh, there are many, many more, but let's just stick with two um, for the sake of this evening. And the two are their common quest for coherence and their common commitment to the importance of evidence. Let's think, first of all, about coherence for a moment. Of course, coherence is a key criterion in the scientific enterprise. How do we make sense of the data? I think it's fair to say um, that mathematical physicists are famous for their addiction to theories which they believe on the grounds of their elegance long before any empirical data are available to support the theory one way or the other. Einstein was uh, classic in that particular way. He was not at all impressed by the experimental confirmation of his theory. He once remarked that I do, do not by any means find the chief significance of the general theory of relativity in the fact that it predicted a few minute observable facts, but rather in the simplicity of its foundation and in its logical consistency. So that's a, a very, very strong commitment to mathematical coherence. In this context, I think it's rather interesting to read the words of the uh, cosmologist Paul Davis in his book, The Goldilocks Enigma. Uh, Davis looks at the universe not as a religious believer, but as somebody impressed and intrigued by its very remarkable uh, properties. It, it looks like it was meant to be here. It looks like we were meant to be here. Um, he writes in The Goldilocks Enigma, even atheistic scientists will wax lyrical about the scale, the majesty, the harmony, the elegance, the sheer ingenuity of the universe of which they form so small and fragile a part. As the great cosmic drama unfolds before us, it begins to look as though there is a script, a scheme of things which its evolution is following. We are then bound to ask who or what wrote the script or did the script somehow miraculously write itself. The fact that the universe conforms to an orderly scheme and is not an arbitrary muddle of events prompts one to wonder, God or no God, whether there is some sort of meaning or purpose behind it all. And then on the very next page, um, he relates that. Davis relates this to Stephen Weinberg's famous statement, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless, to which Davis um, then responds, can a, can a truly absurd universe so convincingly mimic a meaningful one? I think that's not a, a bad question. And of course, the point here is that it's the existence, the explicability of the universe that itself requires explaining, not just the properties once it's arrived, which of course is what keeps us all busy now as scientists. And I find it interesting, speaking from within the Christian tradition to which I belong, that it's intriguing. The Bible um, displays, if you like, its first great big hypothesis on the very first page and in the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So you find no attempt here to sort of try and prove the point as you would find in uh, a kind of rational Greek philosophy text. Genesis simply claims this is the big model and all that follows is only really going to make sense if you incorporate all your data into this big first starting point. And I have to say, as someone involved in biomedical research, that's really pretty much the way we work. Certainly it is in immunology. And so the role of big theories, I've just likened them here to an amoeba going around and swallowing up little bits of data. Their role is to continue to make the data coherent. And if they stop doing that, then the theory uh, will be overthrown or certainly have to be modified and so forth. And this, of course, raises the question of what counts as data in this quest for coherence. In any given branch of science, that's usually pretty clear what you have to do um, to address uh, to find data that will count for or against a particular scientific theory. What about the rival metaphysical theories that actually, um, of which there are not many in fact in the world, I put two up there, atheism and the Christian idea of a personal God. Of course, atheism is, atheism is suggesting nothing beyond matter and energy. Uh, you just have to take the universe as a brute fact, that's it. Idea of a personal God intentions and purposes and bringing the universe into being, including us. So how do we go about the business of weighing up the probability of one or other of these being correct? And I want to suggest that one way of doing that is what we do in science all the time. Um, and I've likened the, these big rival metaphysical theories just to a great big circle here. And then within it, we have all these smaller circles which represent 
all of the various realities that we experience and discover during the course of our life. So I want to put everything in there. You can put in science and history and the scriptures, psychology, politics, whatever you want, put it in there, because I don't see any reason why we should exclude any of those domains of knowledge and experience and insight um, when we're discussing some of these great big uh, metaphysical uh, theories and so forth. And what I would want to suggest is the total weight, if you like, of the data. You have to weigh it up. Well, which model makes best sense of what I see and experience in the world? And I find that quite helpful, actually, in certainly I dialogue a lot with atheists and debating and so forth and so on. And that kind of approach, actually, I find quite useful in terms of um, having a sensible kind of dialogue, um, at least, uh, to get the discussion on the road. Now, notice that there is no yellow, no yellow box, no yellow circle here, which is labeled um, God of the Gaps, okay? And I think it's, it is truly amazing how um, much time really has been wasted by both uh, religious sets of people and also by atheists in this so-called God of the Gaps argument, the suggestion that <clears throat> the actions of God are in some special sense indicated by pointing to these arenas of our current scientific ignorance. And I would want to suggest the big presupposition of Christian theism completely undermines this sort of God of the gaps argument. And we can go back to Augustine at the beginning part of the 5th century, um, and he's writing there in his great commentary on Genesis, uh, and saying that nature is what God does. Nature is what God does. That is what we understand by creation in Christian, uh, traditional Christian theology. And so... The fact that we may or may not have gaps in our, in our scientific knowledge at the moment is really um, irrelevant to, I think, the theological discussion. So I would want to say that certainly Christians have no kind of hidden investments in scientific ignorance um, because, of course, the god of the gaps is a hostage to fortune. The time will come when those gaps get filled up. And then, of course, what happens to your belief in God? So... Um, in terms of the, um, how I would like to approach this sort of weighing up of different types of data, I guess we have to go to the sort of phrase that we use very often as scientists in the discussion or results sections of our papers where we talk about something being consistent with. And I would want to say, as far as I'm concerned as a Christian, all of those yellow circles are just, it, if you weigh them up, they are much more consistent with the idea of God as creator. I actually went to... Uh, to the paper that we had out a couple of years ago and just looking for this phrase I was alarmed to see I think six times in one short paper that we came up from my own laboratory uh, there you find the phrase consistent with maybe we overused it in that paper in fact but you know it's a very common little phrase that you find in our scientific papers so the data that we see you have to weigh it up it's just more consistent with um, this starting um, idea of a God who has intentions and purposes for the world then the second and last thing I want to mention is the shared um, commitment to the importance of evidence that we find in the scientific enterprise as well as in the uh, enterprise of faith. And I think for many people out in the public domain, this comes as a bit of a surprise. Surely it's the case the world of science and reason uh, belongs to science, uh, sorry, the world of reason and evidence belongs to science, whereas religion is all, all about personal experience and so forth and so on. I don't think that's actually the case. And certainly, of course, all three Abrahamic faiths uh, make certain historical claims, of course, not least Christian faith revolving around the claims about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And I find it very interesting the way that the early church community reasoned about the basis for their faith. Those who've done even a little bit of work on the philosophy of science will be familiar with Karl Popper, the idea that uh, refutation or falsifiability um, is one of those key demarcation lines between science and non-science. It's not true of all the sciences, but certainly in the case of the biomedical sciences I've been involved in, that is a very key uh, demarcation line. So if you can't think up even bits of data in principle that would refute your theory, then it does not belong to science in that kind of way of thinking. I find it intriguing that the Apostle Paul had very similar kind of Popperian thinking, in fact, when he was writing to the church in Corinth about the resurrection of Christ. Basically, he said, if the resurrection didn't happen, you know, then, uh, well, let's uh, um, eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow. We die. So let's all go home. I mean, if the resurrection didn't happen, you know, then, then forget it. 
So this is very Popperian thinking. I think Paul actually was a Popperian before his time, in the sense that, um, you know, at the time, of course, he was writing, had the dead body of Jesus been embalmed and then was discovered uh, lying in some grave in Jerusalem or whatever, I mean, it could easily have been recognized by, by the family of Jesus. They were still alive. Many people knew him and so on and so forth because uh, Paul was really laying his faith on the line at that particular moment. We, we're not in the same way, but I think we can enter into the empirical uh, reasoning of this, uh, that first century Christian community. So actually, in all kinds of ways, I find that my thinking as a scientist actually has parallels and resonances with my thinking um, as a Christian. And indeed, I think that probably helps to explain why certainly in Cambridge, the science departments have lots of Christians in them. Loads of Christians around the science departments, very few in the humanities. Okay, just think about that. So there's something going on there um, which we can discuss. So, but I need to finish. Um, is there a conflict between science and faith? Well, sociologically, clearly there is, um, but a closer look suggests there's really no need for it. In fact, I think in some ways the new atheists have done the Christian community and others a service by challenging complacent thinking, by helping religious believers uh, to think more carefully about their faith. And as they do that, I think many of them are recovering this great historical sense of the very close partnership between science and faith that really goes back as we were thinking over so many centuries and at the same time they've seen how that cousinly relationship plays out in the similar ways of thinking that I think do exist between people of science and people in faith. So at the end of the day I think we ought to thank Richard Dawkins for helping us all to think more carefully about how we relate these two great enterprises of science and faith and on that happy note, I will be pleased to close. Thank you and take questions. Thank you. Okay, is any religion, no, I know. I have a model, I have a version of this, in fact, which um, flips between all the levels as you're watching it. So they all mix up, okay. But then certain people who, who are um, sensitive to flickering screens complained about that, so I, I took that off. But so um, I don't want to, s to make any particular point about religion sort of being the bottom. I mean, you could make a story about that, but it, yeah, don't read too much into models. The danger of all models is you know, you can read too much into it. That's a problem. Okay, so it's not trying to do all that kind of work. So, yeah. And similarly, by having a scientific at the top, likewise, you know, I'm not saying science is at the top of the pile and religion is at the bottom. <laughs> so, it's just the um, restrictions of having a, a model on the screen, really. So, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. Uh, another question. Well, I think we could, I mean, I, I would start perhaps a little bit further back in the sense that I think real knowledge, I mean, this was, a, of course, a problem for Darwin. He worried about how can we have knowledge when we have an evolved brain, okay? So how can the, the brain of humankind that's so similar to that of the ape, you know, somehow have real knowledge? And that, that was something that really worried, actually, people like Darwin. I think, actually, um, for those of us who start in the basis of Christian theology, we know we, we have real knowledge because we believe we have a trust in um, a God of reason who has created a reasonable world where, in fact, things do behave in an orderly manner. I would see it as um, a display of the faithfulness of God that things behave consistently. 
And this, of course, is tied also with the whole question of evil and theodicy. But because we have a consistent world, we can do science. I mean, science is possible, otherwise we wouldn't know where we were. And I think it's very significant that science came out of Christian theology to a very large degree, at least as far as European science is concerned. And of course, Islamic science played a huge role as well with this very monotheistic deep conviction. And, and, and so it didn't come out of other cultures where um, there wasn't the understanding of a consistent God who could make things consistently. So, I mean, science would never have come out of Babylonian uh, polytheism, for example, because you have all these squabbling gods and you wouldn't know where you were, really, you know, because they might change the way things behave. Once you have a consistent God who is the moral and scientific lawgiver, then I think we have, uh, then we have a basis for real knowledge. We can, have, we can really know stuff because God has made things in an orderly way, including our own brains, including our own personhood, um, all of that is part of God's good creation, albeit marred by sin, but it's part of God's creation. So that seems to me to give a very, very powerful basis for the validity of all forms of all kinds of knowledge. Okay, we are fallen, so none of our knowledge is complete, it's incomplete. We see through a glass darkly, if you like, but basically, you know, we can agree uh, all around the world about certain things being the case in science. So it's very important, I think, not to see God as an agent, as one cause amongst many within the system of the world, because that, to me, denies the fundamental Christian doctrine of creation. And I think if we go back to Aquinas, and indeed to Augustine, and indeed to the biblical text, we have a God who is the source of all that exists. And so what we're looking at as scientists in our everyday scientific lives is simply uh, we're, we're studying the faithfulness of God. That's what we're doing, actually. Theologically, that's what we're doing. So all science has a theological aspect to it where we're actually enjoying God's works. We're going into the laboratory as an act of worship. And Robert Boyle, it is said, um, sometimes did some of his experiments deliberately on a Sunday because he felt that doing chemistry was an act of worship. Okay, I'm not so sort of recommending that necessarily, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, that's the way Boyle thought about it. But I think it's very deeply, profoundly significant that you know, that doing our science is a reflection of the orderliness and faithfulness of God. And now, of course, as those who are Christian believers who, who experience God answering prayer and, and working through their lives and, you know, and so forth, of course, God has, you know, the individual relationship with individuals and that. But I think we're talking here about the back cloth of the ordinary workings of the universe, you know, the way, the stuff that we look at as scientists. That, to me, is a wonderful reflection of the faithfulness of God. Please come back, because I don't know if I really got to the heart of your question. Yep. I think absolutely. Let's. Uh, I think we have to think a little bit in two categories here, in the sense that there is the the normal way that God works and does things in the world. And I would want to say, um, God is imminent in His created order. He's absolutely involved in up upholding and sustaining every single aspect of the whole universe. So, natural laws um, are simply descriptions of God's faithfulness. I mean, that's our human attempt to describe. God's faithfulness in the created order. So I want to turn your argument completely upside down, actually, and actually say there are no such things as natural laws in terms of being independent in some sort of thing. And that's why Robert Boyle in the 17th century wrote a whole book um, against nature, okay? Because the idea of nature as being some quasi-autonomous entity comes from Greek philosophy, and it was very popular in the Enlightenment and still popular today. The Bible has, the Bible doesn't use the word nature, okay? There is no such thing as nature in biblical thought. Let's get it out of our language, you know? So, so it's not a question of God interfering with natural laws. It's a question of the fact that God is very faithful. We, as scientists, describe his faithfulness in terms of laws because he is very, very faithful. But of course, God can do things differently at certain times in miracles, as you point out, and God can work in answer to prayer in mysterious ways. We don't fully understand mechanistically how that works. Um, 
but also, you know, so God is an involved God in every aspect of the created order, um, but he's obviously involved in a different kind of way in his per personal relationship with us, let's say, as Christians. So I think I'm agreeing with you totally, but wanting to come at it from a rather different direction, because I think once we talk about God interfering with natural laws, we're sort of setting the discussion up as if there are two separate powerful entities. We have sort of natural laws and God who comes in and sort of changes them. And I think that, that is not theologically correct as far as I can see. I think that we need to see the natural laws, so-called, as simply the reflections of God's working and faithfulness. And certainly that's, if you go back to Boyle or Descartes or uh, Newton, that's how exactly how they would understand the laws. These, these are God's laws, you know, these are God's faithfulness. So I'm just coming at it at a slightly different angle, I think, from the way that, yeah. Well, no, that's a very good question. I think everyone heard that. So the question really is, when we're talking about um, God as the source of everything, do we include, for example, mathematical principles or the notion of three as being a thing and so forth? I would want to say yes, definitely, yeah. In other words, I mean, I don't know of any mathematician who is not a, a, a Platonist in some way. I mean, who, you know, I mean, I don't know of any mathematician who just thinks that numbers are something in our heads and not out there as some reality that actually exists. That includes atheistic mathematicians as much as believing mathematicians. They just think, you know, there are, there's stuff out there which is intrinsic to the properties of the universe, uh, which is mathematically correct and which we have to discover. Okay, so, um, so uh, yeah, so that's a something. Yeah, definitely. I would want to say that. Yeah, so all abstract principles or ways of working. So this is where you get in discussion what we mean by nothing. Okay, so you have to be careful when say, people say, well, you know, it didn't, it sprang out of nothing. Well, what do we mean by nothing here? <laughs> okay, so, so nothing really means nothing. And nothing would certainly include no mathematical principles of any kind, no thing. So, yeah, I think God is a source of, of all of that. And, and indeed, of course, uh, people like Johann Kepler, you know, would see God very much as the mathematician. The, Well, that's right. Yep. Yep. I think, you know, I mean, if God is a mathematician, he has all the maths in his head, I mean, in his mind, you know, so, um, so God is that, that mind comes first. So in Christian theology, mind is first. That comes first before the unloading of mind into reality that we experience and study and enjoy. Yep. So I think that is, but that's how I would see it anyway. I, can't actually hear. <laughs> Oops, oh, I <that> kind of. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Yeah, actually, that, I was talking about that at lunchtime, but I, I'm not, you know. I know you weren't able to say, okay, no. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a very interesting example of the fact that we were talking at lunchtime about how evolutionary biology is so very constrained and how, um, of course, in Simon's view, that the fact we're here is pretty much inevitable, that this is um, evolutionary biology in that sense has been designed that we would be here. And uh, I was suggesting, I find it a little hard to go quite that far, I mean, um, given um, that we only have one example of life on this planet, you know, the, the one on this planet. And so I was suggesting at lunchtime that if we had a few more examples 
of life from other planets. In fact, that would be very helpful, especially if we could find, you know, that um, if we came across a planet that had been around, where life had been around for a couple of billion years, you know, and if it was already beginning to show signs of increased complexity and so forth, then that would be wonderful, you know. Um, but yes, I think it's a very powerful uh, argument for evolution being highly constrained and uh, direct, directional maybe and you know actually if we did replay the ta tape of life again then I think it uh, it would be I think be quite likely that you know we would be here and this is what evolution does it's very hard to be very you know so robust about that without other examples really from other planets I think that's the problem but you may have read his book um, Inevitable Humans in a Lonely Universe. There's a book that um, came out by Cambridge University Press a few years ago. And one thing you might be interested in is the map of life. If you go to www.mapoflife.org, just as it sounds, mapoflife.org, that website has just been launched by, by Simon in Cambridge uh, on Tuesday, this week. <laughs> so, uh, and I couldn't go to the reception because I was flying out um, here just the, the morning after. But um, there they've got hundreds of wonderful recent examples of convergence. You might want to go there. It's a good website. Who was the they? I missed it. Uh, T.H. Huxley. Oh, Huxley. The, the yeah. Or... Yes. Um, I don't think they were so much influenced by historical exemplars. I mean, they, certainly they took, they got hold of Galileo. That's about the only one, really. You know, in a, in a way, as a sort of classic kind of so-called conflict thing in the history of the church. Although even that, of course, was well was just a debate within the Catholic Church, of course, really. And and but anyway. I don't think it was so much historical as the, what they faced at that time. Now, Thomas Henry Huxley is a very interesting story. He, um, he couldn't get a job at first in science in Britain. He went to work in Australia, and then um, he came back. His fiance was, um, was actually, they were separated for several years because he didn't have enough money to bring his fiance over to Britain. Um, so, and you know, it was a time when, I mean, you couldn't really get a job as a professional scientist. They weren't around, and so he looked at all these clerics and people who had the full backing of the Anglican Church and all the financial support of the establishment of the time. And I, I think a lot of it was, let's get what they've got, you know, and let's get that over to this new secularized profession of scientists. So I think it was much more to do with the social situation in which he found himself, both in his own per personal life, but also in society around him. And there were sufficient numbers of people then, you know, to, to make a, a group of people who campaigned in that direction. I think. Yeah, I mean, he actually, although he sounded in that quote that I gave very like, um, like Richard Dawkins, in a way he wasn't. I mean, he, he did appreciate religion. And he, he often... In other passages, he would um, critique those who saw a conflict between science and religion. And um, I mean, there are old stories about T.H. Huxley and his friend singing Victorian hymns around the piano on Saturday evenings, you know, um, because they were still imbued, you know, with this Victorian religiosity and so forth. You know, it was still very much deep in their, in their bones. So you get these sort of quite conflicting um, sort of stories coming out of his life and those of his contemporaries. But... Um, but I think it was really, the key point here is the sort of parting of the ways, you know, that here you see the scientists going off and becoming scientists, a professional community, separate from divinity faculty down the road, theologians going off to do their thing. And, and that sort of separation really has been a characteristic, I think, hasn't it, of our universities to a large degree since that time. I'm always fascinated in visiting Harvard, where the, uh, one of the departments of biology there is like, that distance from the Faculty of Divinity. I mean, you can only just get down this little passageway. It's really narrow. And I often thought, and yet, because I've asked when I go there, I mean, the distance in terms of views of things and how they do things and whether you talk to each other is very, very big indeed. So, um, so, so I think it, that was a key point, really, in the separation idea between science and religion, um, the professionalization. So I'm... There's, a, there's some nice bi biographies of T.H. Huxley that might go more into his philosophical grounding, so I may not be doing that justice, really, but yeah.
mm -hmm. this conflict. But nevertheless, from what I'm hearing you say, it sounds like uh, there was a bit of a dispute over resources and power at mm -hmm. first. Who's got the money, essentially? Who's, and uh, where, the, where is this going? And you do look at the way science has worked out. As many times people say, science works. Sometimes they'll say that, you know, the, the implication is that religion didn't. You know, science explains the world and it does things in a way that supposedly religion does not. And of course, that also means that it leads to economic success and so on. And is there, is there a suggestion here, am I hearing you right, that maybe there is perhaps an economic, uh, at least part of the explanation is how this whole warfare uh, talk arose, and maybe it was driven to an extent by economic factors. Like in this case, I hate, it does sound like a little bit of class and we mm -hmm. discussed here a moment ago. But mm -hmm. also, as far as the driver of this, it could be in part, you know, well, you know, scientific success in the Industrial Revolution, and so and since then, it leads to profit. And is 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 there a possibility that there is this? economic factor that helps to explain what's driven this whole language of warfare and conflict between one mm -hmm. model where resources used to be tied up and now it's shifted to this other direction, mm -hmm. so a more technological direction. Yeah, and no, I, I think there is a real truth in that. I mean, certainly I'm, I'm simply, I'm a second, you know, I, I'm going to historians and just reading what they say, but I, I think certainly in historians of the late uh, Victorian period we would see that as one factor. I mean, it's one factor amongst a number of factors. But the power control thing, I think, certainly did involve finance. And the fact, you know, as a scientist, you couldn't really get a job. I mean, there was no jobs where you get paid. You still have to have patronage. And still, you find Charles Darwin is your classic natural philosopher. I mean, Charles Darwin didn't like calling himself a scientist. That was something a bit distasteful, really. I mean, that was, you know, for, you know not for people like himself who who had inherited a lot of money from the Wedgwood family. He married into money and so forth. And, you know, so he lived the life of a, of a gentleman cleric, actually. In fact, the house he lived in, as a matter of fact, was a previous vicarage in, uh, in, in you know, not far from London. So he, he lived very much the life that his father had originally intended for him by sending him to Cambridge to read divinity. <laughs> okay. So, um, but in terms of the money, I think certainly that was a factor of the X Club. Um, they saw a very wealthy uh, Anglican church that you know, was extremely wealthy and, and clerics were well paid and the dream of your 19th century cleric was to get a nice comfortable uh, living and go in the country, you could be a naturalist, you could collect butterflies, you could, you know, you had time to do stuff, you know. And, and so of course, for someone like T.H. Huxley who was much more, you know, from uh, a different class of society and so forth, I mean, he felt, so I think money definitely was a factor there, you know, that, and it's very interesting. I mean, the, the, the government um, bestowal, certainly in the UK, of more funds to science is very striking in the latter part of the 19th century. I mean, they were successful in their campaign. And in one sense, I mean, you know, I would say, well, good. You know, they did a good job. You know? um, I think science is good to put money in. So I don't think, you know, it's not all sort of negative. Just because it's part of the origins of this particular conflict thesis, I don't think we should um, see it in a negative light in some ways. But it just is unfortunate that it led to a real parting of the ways, I think, in, in terms of science and religion being ending up in separate compartments. So, we are, if I could just say, we have an educational study uh, sponsored by the Faraday Institute going on at the moment in, in the UK schools, studying, you know, why did children in high school uh, between the age of 12 and 14, 15, 16, why do they end up thinking that science and faith are in two separate compartments? And uh, this is a study to look at how the educational system shapes that. And again, it's the same thing they do. Of course, we have compulsory religious education in, in the UK, as you know, unlike here. So what happens is, in that case, they, they have one mind for science down one end of the corridor. They walk down to the religious education, and they have a completely different mindset there, and often in complete contradiction. But they just live in these two separate worlds. Um, and the worlds are never really joined up. I think that's the problem. Yes. The, the trends that have developed. Where, where do you see it going now amongst you and your peers, knowing that you see this, this perceived conflict from uh, culture as a whole? Um, within the scientific community, how are you 
what is the discourse going on between you guys, between you and your colleagues to, be, to change this kind of like either or then mentality? Right, I mean, I, okay, that's, it's going to be a different answer, I think, in every country. Okay, so uh, every country is going to be different in that sort of thing. Uh, certainly in terms of the British scientific community, I don't think the British, I mean, Britain is a very secularized country, much more secularized than the United States. For example, in, depending on how you define your secularization, but, you know, in terms of religious commitments, um, however you measure it, it's just really low, right, in Britain. So, so the number of, let's say, Christians you have in the scientific community I would say probably reflects the numbers you get out in the general public, probably more or less. We don't have any hard data on that. So the answer is that within the scientific community, I don't think people usually, you know, they're just busy with their science. They don't even think about these things for the great majority, I would say. Um, in the same way, not because they're scientists, but in the same way the British population doesn't think much about religion in their daily lives at all anyway. So that's simply reflected, you know, in the scientific community. But I mean, the sort of the more the, the, good, the good news is, I think there are uh, a number of um, scientists who are interested in these things. They're not necessarily those with any religious commitments, but they've woken up to the fact actually, you know, religion is really important. Okay, the old secularization thesis of the 1960s is wrong, um, and so forth and so on. You know, and so religion is alive and well in the world, and we better make sure that we understand it and know how to relate to that. And so um, they, well, people like Martin Rees, who is the president of the Royal Society, actually only for a few more weeks, um, and then he hands over to somebody else. But those sort of people are very interested in these kind of discussions. They come along to Faraday Institute things, like we put on events in Cambridge and so on. So you, you do get these sort of centers of science religion going on, which incorporate and bring in scientists into them. But I would say that's more seen as a rather specialized activity in terms of the scientific community as a whole, except for ethics. When it comes to ethical issues, there's a widespread recognition that, you know, that, that the church, let's say, uh, should have a say, and, and so, and welfare committees um, for tackling ethical, ethical committees within universities often will have, in our country, will often have a cleric, you know, as one of their representatives from the community. So that's quite common. So when it comes to ethical issues, there's much more of a recognition that there's a need for input from different religions and so forth. Really so, quick, um, yeah. given your uh, title, this is kind of awesome, uh, given your title for your lecture, have you read uh, The Dawkins Delusion by Alistair? Crowley? I have indeed, and yes. Well, what do you yeah. think about that? Well, The Dawkins Delusion, I mean, Alistair is a good friend of mine, and he would say it's not his best book that he's written about Dawkins. The, the, good, the really earlier solid book he wrote was called Daw um, Dawkins God. It's a much fatter book. And uh, I think it's one of the best books that uh, Alistair McGrath's written. I mean, that's what he thinks himself, actually, as it happens. Um, the Dawkins Delusion, the little thin book, I mean, it, it was rushed out because of needing, I think he got asked by the publisher to do a quick response. And being Alistair McGrath, he wrote it in three weeks or whatever it was, you know, and um, rushed it out, you see. So it was good in the sense of being a quick response. Um, but, you know, it, it's probably limited. And I mean, it's a small book, isn't it? So, uh, but I would recommend The Dawkins God, if you want a more thorough analysis, actually, then uh, that, that, that's a very good book. Yeah. Uh. Any further Can you just speak up just a little bit? I'm sorry, you're far away. Yeah. I'm a student at the seminary here, mm -hmm. and I was curious um, what you might suggest to encourage a more positive attitude in church towards science. Hmm. Oh, yeah, it's a big challenge, isn't it? So, <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, you, you know, I, who am I to say about the situation over here? I mean, I think what we have been trying to do in our context in the Faraday Institute is to um, develop resource materials for churches, not just about that issue, but on the wider relationship between science and faith. And so we produced a set of materials called the Test of Faith. The Test of Faith is a DVD. It's divided into three 25-minute segments, uh, of which the evolution issue is, is one of them. And there's a DVD and a leader's guide and discussion booklet so that people can then have a whole series, you know, over a period of some months um, or maybe teach through it in a Sunday school, something like that. Um, it also comes with a book of testimonies by people like Francis Collins and others about their own Christian faith, people in the sciences. Um, so, th so we're trying to resource the churches, really, you know, to give them materials which will, you know, we're not trying to come with a very heavy message, but just to open up the discussion and show that it's quite possible to 
believe in evolution and be a good Christian and it's fine, you know, you don't have to worry about it. And, you know, that kind of thing, really. And deliberately in the DVD, I mean, we have voices that, you know, we, we want to give every stakeholder a voice. So we have somebody there from Answers in Genesis who gives, um, we have an interview with them. We have, we have Bill Dembski to come in and talk about intelligence. You know, so we have different stakeholders, if you like, and the whole discussion who are represented in the DVD. But um, the overall kind of view of the thing is that mainstream science is, is where we should be at. And there's no reason at all why Christians should want to be critical of mainstream science. So, so I think that's one thing. The other thing we do, and I know it's being done to some degree over here, and we're just talking about it at lunch, is having uh, training days for churches, actually going into a church and giving them the whole program of science and faith for a day. Um, and we have courses for church leaders in Cambridge. So we bring in, usually once a year, we have a course for church leaders and bring them into Cambridge for a few days and just let them, expose them to all kinds of science and ideas and, and so forth. So I think it just... Lots of different ways we should be involved, but I think that's really, really important um, to get that across. Yeah, thank you. If you um, believe in evolution, does that mean you have to discredit Genesis um, the way that it says that God created the universe? Not actually, no. In fact, I, I put up this book, it is on the screen, yeah, um, partly because uh, we didn't really get into that this evening, and um, of course it could be a long discussion if we did, but, um, but I wrote as others have written a book to show indeed that's not the case and that you can perfectly well um, take uh, Genesis and all the other biblical passages about creation um, and be very happy with them and see them as interpreted as one hopes and believes the original authors intended um, and bring that very much in line with evolution. So that book is really all about that. So uh, I, I think part of the problem is, if I might just say one point on this, um, because of the power of science, especially in the 20th century, there was an increasing tendency to interpret texts as if they were scientific texts. I mean, the whole modernist movement, the whole modernist philosophy and idea is that science is the ultimate, you know, kind of arbiter of truth. And therefore, if that's the case, then texts should be interpreted as if they were giving you scientific information or scientific texts. And you find that, I mean, I've lived in the Muslim world for 15 years, and that's very, very strong in the Muslim world. The number of uh, conversations I've had in, on trains in Turkey. I mean, people love talking about theology on trains in Turkey, I tell you. So I, I remember once getting into a train in Istanbul and sat down, there was just a man opposite, and uh, we immediately got talking. We always talk in trains in Turkey. And he said, oh, you're from England. Um, oh, good. Can you explain to me the doctrine of the Trinity? You know, that was in the, that was in the first two minutes, okay? Uh, so, you know, they, they don't mind talking about theology on trains um, in Turkey. Um, but they also think, you know, uh, many Muslims think that all scientific discoveries are in the Bible, uh, sorry, not the Bible, in the, in the Quran. And of course, um, then they start telling you all these verses in the Quran, which seem, you know, quantum theories in there and getting man on the moon and all kinds of stuff. It's all in the Quran, you see. So, so then you have a long discussion about that. But actually, some Christians are almost, I won't say quite as strong as that, but you know, they, they would almost see uh, all kinds of discoveries are in there as if the Bible had to be some kind of scientific text. Whereas, of course, we know the Bible contains 20 different types of literature. It's a collection of books, after all. And, um, and really, scientific literature cannot possibly be one of them because scientific literature really wasn't, didn't really come into being until much, much later. You know, we don't really see it getting going as specialized literature until the first scientific societies in the 17th century and onwards, and it's become more specialized ever since. So I think we have to be very careful not to treat the biblical texts as if they were some sort of modern literature and it, take words and impose upon them scientific meanings they were never really meant to bear so that, that I just put a word of caution in there I think so uh, yeah. Right, right yeah. Yeah. Um, personally while I see no, while I see the congruity between religion and science I see a conflict between the mechanism of evolution in which animals have to die or feel pain in order for uh, other animals to change mm -hmm. this seems If the Christian God was omnipotent and omnibalevolent, he could create an infinite amount of ways where you can have diversity of life without having pain or suffering. Right. I mean, I think that that's a very interesting point. I don't know if people hear the questions from right far away up there. Can you hear these questions down here? Or are you just ding emails up there? Or I don't know. <laughs> I don't mind. You know, but I just didn't want people to be um, not, you know, 
engaged in the questions if you couldn't hear them. But um, yeah, I mean, I think the point here is that, of course, um, I mean, obviously God can do what he wants. I mean, we all believe that for Christians, God can do anything he wants, okay. Um, it sort of comes back to the preface of Principia with Coates saying, you know, well, actually, um, what we have to find out as scientists and people in the world is, well, how has God done things in the world? And I'm thinking also of what, you know, God revealed through the prophet Isaiah when God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. And I think there is a little bit of danger here that we might be almost, I'm not saying you're doing this in your question, but almost creating God in our own image or creating the kind of God that we think um, should be there or the kind of world that we, or universe that we think God should have done, okay. And I think what we have to do as Christians is, is look at scripture and we have to look at the world and just be honest and truthful about what we see there. I have to say, when I look into scripture, I don't see it saying there wasn't any death or suffering before the fall. I can't see anywhere in scripture that says that, although some people seem to think it's there, but I, I, I don't find it there myself. Um, so that's one part of the discussion, obviously. Uh, I think the other part of the discussion is certainly from science. I mean, it's pretty clear there's been death of animals and plants and everything around for millions and billions of years. You know, I mean, fossils and chalk. You know, we have lovely, you know, hundreds of meters of yards of chalk in our country, I'm sure. There's, you know, what are, what's chalk made of and so on. So, I mean, you know, I think there's death all over when you look at the earth and so forth. Now, of course, I know you can get into discussions about dating and all these sort of things, but I, I think the direction I would want to take the discussion is that we should look at, you know, just look at the data that we have, really, and, and rather than trying to think, well, what kind of a universe should God have made? <laughs> I think that's a dangerous question for humans to ask, actually, in some ways. Um, and it's interesting, when you look, read the book of Job, of course, all about suffering, God never gave an answer to Job, did he? Even by the end, he never got an answer, you know. <laughs> but he came to know God in a more closer way than he had before. But that's just the beginning of a long discussion. Yeah, I yeah, see. the Job part, again, this is theoretical, but couldn't God create a way for Job to know God without any pain or suffering? Yeah, so, I know. That's the, exactly the point. Exactly the point. So, I mean, I think the question is, you could say, well, we could understand God, you, I mean, God clearly does use, you know, suffering and pain and, and all these things uh, for his purposes. Then you have ask the question, well, do we really need that much? You know, that's the big question. Do we really need that much? You know, um, 3.8 billion years of evolution with billions and billions of things dying and so on. And in a sense, I think we're a little bit like um, physicists maybe with quantum theory or something. I mean, okay, Schrodinger's equation is great in terms of fulfilling all the experimental ex expectations that are thrown at it. But try and get your head around quantum mechanics, I think, well, I, I don't think most people, I don't know, I'll ask the physicists, but I think most people conceptually can't do that. Entanglement, you know, how does one, so certain things in science where, I mean, maybe there's just missing bits of the equation, you know, which make it easier to get a head around, but probably not, that isn't the case at the moment. So I'm sure there are missing bits of the equation, if you like, that God has not revealed to us. And so we are gonna have puzzles about that, I think. Um, but having said that, it's also the case, and also a fact, that you know, suffering in our own lives can often produce some wonderful outcomes and in, in spiritual outcomes, not necessarily ones that we would prefer to have and so on. And so some people have suggested you know, that God has made this world to be more like a boot camp than a holiday camp, a vacation camp, you know, that it's a tough world. And it's a world um, in which dependence on God's grace is the only safe option, actually. Um, so this is the kind of world we're in. It's a really hard world, tough world. And it only makes sense, of course, in light of the new heavens and the new earth. Without that, it would make no sense at all. So that's a very important point. But it's sort of a big discussion. Actually, in that book, we also get into that whole issue of theodicy and animal suffering and that kind of thing as well. Yeah.
Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Well, I mean, I think on that, you know, one has to think, well, one only start, usually, generally, in science and so on, we only start up making very special, you know, kind of arguments if there's a good reason to do so. It seems to me there's no particular reason to think why things have been any different. Um, I mean, certainly, of course, we can look back into deep time um, through astronomy and so forth. We're looking back in time, you know, billions of light years and, and so forth. And so we are, we have the ability to look back in time, you know, at uh, distant planets. We can look at um, star formation as, as happening millions of years ago and so forth, you know, simply because of the amount of time it takes for light to get to our telescopes and so on. So in a sense, we're looking back in time anyway. Um, you know, so that in itself is not unusual. But I mean, I don't, for all of that, um, you know, from cosmology and astrophysics and so on, I don't think there's any necessity to think, you know, that things haven't been the same in that sense, that things haven't beha behaved consistently. I mean, you know, if you want a philosophical discussion, you can always say, well, how do you know, and so on. But it seems to me the only make up um, kind of special arguments if there's a need to do it, you know, or something like that. And there's no, and, and the planet, is, okay, it's fairly old, but, you know, it's, um, I don't see any, re why, why would we want to make those sort of things? I, you know, I don't quite see why we'd want to suggest that. In other words, there has to be a good reason to suggest that um, things behaved differently a few million years ago. Of course, if you go back to the very early femtoseconds of the Big Bang, then you, it's a different story, you know, but that's a very, very special case, I think, so, and cosmologists can tell us about that, but... No, that's a very good question. In case you couldn't hear at the back, the question is really if we have a long process of evolution, if you start at the Big Bang and then all the way through to humankind, um, at what point does humankind start being made in the image of God or ensouled or whatever other language we want to use there? Well, I mean, I think the, um, the Genesis text makes it clear that being, you know, that man was made on the, you know, on the sixth day in the image of God is a key fact about being different from the animals. None of the animals um, had the image of God bestowed upon them. And so, um, whereas actually in Solment, um, it, it, well, the Genesis text again says that man became a nephesh. Man became a nephesh. Man became a living being. And the word used there, actually, nephesh, as a breath, life, um, is used also of animals. So actually that language in that moment in the Genesis text does not distinguish us from animals. So it's not actually in Solomon, um, in terms of the nephesh. What distinguishes us from animals in the Genesis text is, is being made in the image of God. Um, male and female, he created them. And that's made in the context of having uh, dominion over the earth, of having responsibility for the earth, of caring for the earth, uh, and of knowing God, of being responsible to him, of knowing his commands. Uh, and so on. So there are certain things there, relational things, responsibility things, which are all bound up with being made in the image of God. So the question then, of course, is typical Westerners that we are, we like to have a timeline, you know, when did that happen? Which, I, you know, what point? Um, and of course, that's a difficult one to answer, definitely. But there are various models about that. So, for example, um, one idea is that uh, God called a community or two people to himself, uh, maybe Neolithic people living in the Nase, who were farmers, um, and chose them to come into fellowship with himself, revealed himself to them. Uh, it was actually John Stott, a Christian leader you know, from London, who originally sort of had this idea and said, well, maybe these are the homo divinus. These are the first spiritually alive people in God's plan. And so these were the progenitors, these were the founders of God's family on earth. These are the people who knew the one true God, um, rather than all the polytheistic ideas around them and so on. And these were the people who then really understood what it was to be made in God's image and uh, to have responsibilities to care for the earth and so on. That's a sort of model, okay, that's not, you have to, you know, that's a speculative model, but it's sort of, I think, quite interesting, because then it says that 
this is nothing to do with evolution per se. You know, evolution is necessary but not sufficient to bring you to spiritual life. In other words, you can have big frontal lobes, you can have language, and you can have art and so forth without actually being spiritually alive. And that, that it says that actually the image of God is about being spiritually alive to God and knowing him. And that's what it's really about, okay? Um, and so the homo dimonis then would be when that comes in, if you like, into the story. But to pin a date on that would be really hard, I think. And that's one model, I think, amongst several, you know, but I think there are ways of doing, letting theology do its work in that way and letting the evolution just do its work. And I think you can you know, have some pretty nice models really of bringing those two narratives together. So, um, but it, 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 so. Yes. Right.